thank you for asking me. I have many theoretical friends in Manchester. I don't mean theoretical friends, I mean friends through theory, um, or maybe both. And um, thank you to Anna and to Helen and to Henry for having me. I'm sorry, I don't have any pretty pictures to show you, um, but my paper is short, so there's a compensation for that. Deleuze and Guattari state, <coughs> affects are the becoming inhuman of man. Encounters with art necessitate becoming a human in so a human one way. Insofar as art is defined as that which affects along trajectories deliberately organised to alter perception. This is so even when the art may seem to seek to reflect a reality in a more precise or reduced way. Art attends to creating from chaos, but the result is the opposite of the mapping of this chaos by determined coordinates. Deleuze and Guattari rethink science, philosophy and art as always including, and I quote, and I do not know that is positive and creative, the condition of creation itself, and that consists in determining by what one does not know, end quote. Ethics emphasises that art is no longer representative in two ways. The first is that from an ethical perspective, art should represent what is unrepresentable, bearing witness to the unspeakable that is in the excess of language and to which conversion to language refuses bearing witness by inserting unspeakable art into a register or a lexicon that by virtue of this inclusion imagines all art represents and all unspeakable acts are representable, thereby they cannot be described as inhuman. When initially Ronciere after Leotard orients inhuman art around the forsaking of the other that dehumanises and therefore demands representation in order to verify the need to bear witness, a doubling occurs which shows that inhuman art comes from the dehumanisation <coughs> of subjects and this inhumanity is necessary in order for certain lives to not be excluded. The lesson we learn from inhuman art, which is the art of the unrepresentable and unspeakable, is that maintaining human perception coming from human subjectivity is itself unethical. Those who cannot be converted to description and representation are excluded. Rather than selecting equality as a raising up of the other to representability, Art's responsibility is to resist the human perception that creates unspeakable acts, which for Ronciere is an ethical denunciation of the very phenomenon of representation. The definition of ethical art is the obligation to present the unpresentable, to catalyse thought impossible for the human subject to recognise, make sense of and master. The onus is neither on the artwork nor the mythologised intent of the artist, but the subject or witnesses coming toward or path taken. For this reason, this paper will explicitly avoid referencing specific works of art and further what would even constitute an artistic genre. While most immediately art is associated with fine art, literature, music and so forth, it can also include bodies, movements and experiences of desire considered ordinary in one's day. Deleuze and Guattari state, the distinction clearly does not come down to representation or not, since no art and no sensation have ever been representational. In the first case, sensation is realised in the material and does not exist outside its realisation, end quote. In this sense, each event of art, from its genre to material object status, is no more than the singular encounter that realises it. Anything, with, anything which elicits an inevitable rupture of consistencies of perception can, in this formulation, be referred to as art. The rupture is limited only to the extent that it catches us up in a moment which is not a dialectic, but an ecstatic event. Desire for art is an ethical tactic of apprehension. Ethics demands an address to relations of difference, which will necessarily dismantle the subject, and thus desire for art is ethical to the extent that the perceiver mobilises subjective transformation. And um, I'm taking my cue here from Spinoza's uh, will and appetite and the capacity for expression and affect. Deleuze states, Spinoza projects an image of the positive, affirmative life which stands in opposition to the semblance that men are content with. And I'm not even going to say men sick because I think he means men. End quote. In thinking the inhuman encounter with art, key topics are challenged. The negotiation of descriptive and reflective speech which constitutes possibilities of ways of experiencing that come from discursive regime, uh, regimes which precede the subject. These repudiate both the specificity of the work, the perceiver <coughs> and the event and the metamorphosis that ensues. Um, <clears throat> inhuman art also challenges the discourse which constitutes the possibility of this speech anchored 
in the necessary and crucial rationalisation of knowledge through artistic signification as truth and logic as a perceived rational apprehension of a metaphysically transcendental world reflected in art. And this also collapses the perceived a priori as expressive of a finite possibility. Another challenge that inhuman art uh, makes is a challenge to the relationship of dominance of speech and submission to the work of art, which gives the perceiver and the artist the fantasy to describe and thus constitute the work and its affects, and where the expressivity of the work is given the capacity to affect, only when taking up the place and qualities of dominant modes of apprehension. Incommensurability of thinking artistic affect outside of these systems, yet having to admit that all art exceeds these modes of enunciation and categorisation. So inhuman um, art challenges these claims. Certain binaries become prevalent in the modes of perception inherent in these mechanisms. Um, in terms of a dominant mechanism of apprehension, speech over silence, finite knowledge over infinite thought, reflection over creation, recognition over singularity, observation or visualisation over encounters through different modes of visibility, apprehension fulfilling predetermined categories over sensation through resonation and dissipation, dialectics over the interstitial and interiority-exteriority over an inflective in-betweenness. Revolution comes from the ethics of perceiving ourselves as already in artistic language and ethics of desire. Perceiving the possibility of transcendental signifiers perceives tran transcendental subjectivity through observation of transcendental elements, words, images, bodies. Reading is prevented if a language is not known to the reader, whereas a visual language, while always different between cultures and countries, is ubiquitously resonant with the way speaking subjectivity is apprehended through the flesh. As can be seen toward the last two polarisations, the conflation of these binaries is not one of exchange, putting faith in transgression trumping normalisation or deconstruction reversing regulation. The art encounter is the work catalyzing the encounter with outside. This is an awkward expression, but I don't want to say the outside because I don't want it to be a demarcated space. It's obviously <clears throat> a kind of encounter with thought after Blanchot and Foucault. The experience of outside no longer sees counting as human, as crucial or ethical in perceiving art. The outside involves the disintegration of the I who speaks in speaking about. The I speaks belongs uh, the I speak belongs to a sovereign language. The speaker that dissolves in art proliferates thought. Art need not resonate with the human world to succeed. The a human planes into which art launches us are outside. We bear witness to art it does not account for us as human. Outside suggests without defining encounters, which are unimaginable, proximity without observation or demarcation. Alterity, ambiguity, the voluminous void. But these paradigmatic elements should not be understood as antagonistic or extricable. Outside includes everything as emergence, recession, and ultimately death as the self is outside self but within the world, inapprehensible through knowledge. Relation is inflection. There is nothing necessarily dismissive in thinking of outside. <clears throat> Vertiginously pleasurable, because intensely experienced, in the encounter with outside, nothing is lost or exchanged. Michel Serre offers veils as a mode of perceiving relations against empty and emptying structures. A veil has qualities with which both conceal and reveal. It pleats, it manifests and obscures many folds and folds the participants <clears throat> who themselves pleat with the structure and each other and then themselves as othered while in inextricable and univocal emergence with each other. This perspectival expression of the soul is seen most clarified in Deleuze's Leibnizian Baroque. Even if the veil folding and unfolding is one blanket which covers the secret relation between self and the artwork, it lacks the hard corners and geometrical rationalisation of structure. It is defined by contours and textures, adjectives, not the noun which is populated by other nouns, of which the self and the artwork are just two more. Crucially, the veil is not removable. It is also not fused. The veil is the condition of potentiality of the beneath, which is in turn what creates the veil's tantalising, amazing offer. 
It must be understood as both separate and incapable of being removed. It holds no promise of revelation of the relation. While traditional encounters with art offer the theatre of revelation of meaning as a promise for repetition, the veiled relation does not offer those beneath perception of sensation and affect. The theatre of the arts encounter, sorry, the theatre of the art encounters, players are binarised. The perceiver and its other is becoming equivalent to any other biunivocal subject dialectic, beginning sexually with active interpreter and passive work. The compulsion to, the, to remove the veil, to reveal the relation, slaughters desire, sense and event. The veil is the soul of art. Humanistic fantasies of transcendentalism and majoritarian thought forsake this soul. Michel says, calls all dualism. Uh, he says, all dualism does is reveal a ghost facing a skeleton, end quote. The skeleton is the perceiver facing its lover as a ghost. The skeleton is a dead body stripped of all sense and possibility of touch because stripped of all flesh. The ghost is a desperate projected fantasy of the perceiver to remember an other that was always empty and could only be real if imagined, but as material transcendental signifier, actuality never emerges. Deleuze and Guattari offer the visceral volumes of sensorial dualism, and they state, contemplating is creating, the mystery of passive creation is sensation, end quote. Just as it is difficult to select a tactical name for the other participant of the work of art, so the work itself, so the perceiver itself needs a new name, the a-human who is nameless. Pre- and a-human catalysts, such as painting, music, sculpture, literature, cinema, dreams and other forms of art, all of course liberated from their genre, so what I just said is basically anathema, are examples through which we can explore the outside element because they are at once unresponsive and affective without intent. We acknowledge that as unresponsive, questions do not, cannot demand answers. However, against privileging new, new codes of representation, new codes of apprehension formulate an a-human ethics of experiencing art. The material external nature of art can be encountered willfully, while the molecular and despotic elements of art resonate with the turbulent vibrating of the desire potentialised within us. I invoke art as an example of abstraction of signifying form in relation to observer, but becoming inhuman is a coming to all possible events of desire as if they were art and we the supplicant to them. If the work or the working is an outside, intensification which does not constitute an other, thus a potential self, then the most basic definition of the self which is lost is that which was formerly conceived as human. As unresponsive, tragically unresponsive, I'm sure we've all wanted the art to love us back, art is not conceivable as oppositionally related to the human, but it is not without life, per se. So the art encounter is essentially a solitary event, or at least what Bataille would call an inner event, which no longer recognises differences between the intellectual, aesthetic and ethical. The inner of the self belongs also to the outside. Being inner within outside fuses not only subject and object, but time and space, a deliverance towards ecstasy. Ecstasy does not privilege any particular kind of effect. It is not pleasurable as an aesthetic evaluation of worth, Deleuze and Guattari state. We thus come back to a conclusion to which art led us. The struggle with chaos is only the instrument of a more profound struggle against opinion. For the misfortune of people comes from opinion. So the deliverance of the human toward an a-human art is also the deliverance of the minoritarian um, to be pressured to become majoritarian or to fail to be majoritarian and thus be oppressed. Um, so if uh, the misfortune of people comes from opinion, it is also the aesthetic of violence which theory has sought in art, both in representation and perception, in order to constitute revolutionary art. Ecstasy has no describable quality, just as we cannot describe the finite content of art. In ecstatic art encounters, the work is available, incidentally, accidentally, volitionally, for all selves as offering affective potentialization to all subjects. There are no limits or specific requirements for subjects to open, as each opens uniquely as a singularity based on the specificity of their qualities 
and capacities. And this would be the um, capacity to um, express and the qualities uh, which are arrived at from affection. <clears throat> what Deleuze calls the force that is but... Uh, sorry, what Deleuze calls the force that is but does not act, which is pure internal awareness, though not of anything. This is the ecstatic moment. For the ecstatic, experience is outside of time, arrival and expurgated satisfaction. It does not end in sacrifice, nor in exhausted death, including the petit mort. Bataille claims darkness is not absence of light or of sound, but absorption into the outside. The time of inhuman art finds in voluminous ecstasy that reflection is impossible. This is the Stendhal moment, or Augustine's lament, that late have I loved thee, Lord, evincing presence independent from time as the now that cannot be accessed, even while it is constitutive of the ecstatic self. In address to time, this could be called the atemporality of ahumanity, where the resonances of present, past and future, which, while retaining their own qualities, can be tactically perceived as simultaneous. This also hurts. For the art lover, want for a future experience or for the work already sees the want come from a singular experience that has inflamed the possibility of a new desire. So the desire toward a future relation comes from something already been, but that, not, uh, that was not expected. The self disappears at this point. But of course, neither the self nor the work ceases to be sensed and sensible. The other of the art encounter is an intensity plane. It is not a person or a singularly apprehensible piece of art or a pre-desired scripted act of reading, listening, touching or seeing. It is sudden and it is too much. For each art encounter, an event is created that produces a vague choice for the self. To open to an indeterminate revolutionary alterity of self other element, whereby art encountering is an opening up to the outside, or to nomenclature and dampen down the inherent subversive potentials and experience in order to reform the self, much as discursive regulation and institutions, including those which prescribe correct and incorrect readings and interpretations, reform the self-constellation into the human. Pain is there. The pain is the decisive intensity. Forsaking humanity hurts because it both slaughters any sense of hermeneutic subjectivity and the rights counted as affording human. So for some people it hurts more than others. The ethics of the art encounter shows becoming a human is viable and necessary for new ways of thinking alterity in the realities of life for oppressed subhuman and non-human subjects. Clearly, this has always been the case for those unable to control patterns of human signifying systems, from sexual, racial and disabled others to other forms of life such as non-humans and ecosophical interactions which sustain them beyond human manipulation. Just as thought comes not from knowledge but from outside, for Deleuze and Guattari, it is the brain that thinks, not man. Effacement and extenuation take the self-work inflection outside of dialectics and discourse. The future of the self needs rethinking because the past has been experienced as surprising. This involves an infinite imagination and elucidates permanent potentiality of the subject. Yet where is the work? The work of art. Since before it was recognised, lost when it was, the work is achingly non-present to the self for capture and consumption, yet it remains within the self and the self remains within the work. The unique entity created between and as the two is the new being, inherently and more than at least two, but less than a one. It is organic and inorganic, life and non-life. It is beyond human. The art encounter elucidates the new horror of being in the a-signified world as a new state of constant ecstasy, a functioning, expressive entity nonetheless still outside of time. Art shows the seeming, incommensurable, contradictory, but ultimately infinite relation with outside that is always available, and that ecstasy is always present, but transforms its nature within itself. The ecstatic does not, horrifically, cannot die. As it is a vitalistic state, it shatters the necessity of time without shattering the ecstatic as atrophied, reified, or overwhelmed to the point of the breaking of the body without organs. The ecstatic's joy, when the state alters its distribution, it's one that welcomes the new pain. 
Speech, observation and signification find their first fault in the very possibility of being outside the outside, of evaluating through a perceived gap or horizon between which incarnates both temporally and spatially. Reflection is the after, expectation is the before and observation is the spatial distance between. The ecstatic has access to neither space nor time. Ecstasy at art is the state or condition of the being <coughs> which is being without end and being without thought. Yet it does not mean transportation in space or through time. The soul's transport is one of various relations with outside, which is always the same relation. Just as thought is unthought for Deleuze, pain and suffering are neither and both. The temporalisation of pain as experience involves the pain being either on or off, waiting for the pain and watching it recede, so living in a state of what next or when. The ecstatic's non-knowledge does not presume that that which will be known or that which is lost as knowable before it arrives, including the self's knowledge of the self as anything from presence to subjectivity. It does not um, presume that this is an inherent as an element of mournful lament. Lament involves reflection, intentional wanting a, a preclusive self, just as the artwork is wanted as an expected apprehension and the self is vindicated through interpretation of the work. Ecstasy cannot help itself. Taking the event away from preclusion or reflection so is, there is no longer a self of which to speak and there is no longer a knowing of which to know. No memory, neither future nor past, nor even a present, which constitutes presence. Ecstasy cannot ask the question of a self involved in any art encounter beyond the evanescent, blind, silent, everything. Blindness of self through art encounters is not the incapacity to see, only to see through established human structures of the possibilities of how to see, how to read, how to hear, which Deleuze affirms in He Stuttered. Neither memory as history nor future as finite possibility. All is preserved virtually, as a legible inscription and silent record that unfurls infinity. As the self is redistributed in relation with an imperceptible relation with an imperceptible other element, we see that this is a very real, visceral, fibrous, seeping self. Desire for the unknowable other which is never revealed hurts both in the face of its disinterest and in the burden we bear by bearing it without knowing it, without reason, gifting itself to itself, without the demand for it to act any particular way, to respond or to fulfil a void. Anyone who has ever experienced an event of desire from art, or indeed any encounter where the other element recedes as it emerges, knows that this is an emphatically corporeal and cerebral and achingly painful event. Ecstasy as an alternate ethical mode of perception, which can, of course, never be described as being an, but it is the very air itself that infinitely connects elements. The space is a not space. It does not need another space, and it is not demarcated as a space. The relation is outside of past and future, but not present, and it is not present to itself. The event is immobile in that it is complete and does not await movement or transformation. It is already enough but within the devastatingly voluminous familiar circle. And it is ethical because the self that is lost must trust the other as perceiving in this same aperceptive way. <clears throat> it sounds odd, but you know, it's the, the trust that the art A perceives as well. It is the ecstatic saying, I am here but not here, because there is no here which is named, and there is no I which is the occupant in relation to the other that is recognised and by which I know myself as recognisable. Trust is also a trust together with the others I don't know. At its most difficult to comprehend, this may be understood as the ethical which cannot evaluate its relation and accountability for affect which is not present to itself or others but to which we must nonetheless bear witness. I think this is one of the most difficult things about Spinoza because um, we express in order that the other will be affected in the most um, beneficial way, but we can never predict what that affect will be. The artist may produce, but it does not produce progeny. It does not reproduce the artist. The art witness recognises nothing in the encounter with and as the everything that art opens, being both the opening and the open. Unlike the voracious lover who seeks an object upon which to alight, the art object's love demands a kind of inattention, 
which also acknowledges the desperate and hurtful truth that the one that is in proximity, within and extricated from the subject, the work, the intensifier, is inattentive, even if it is attentive. The art, as Deleuze and Guattari claim, needs a non-art. And I love this, like the last line that they end um, what is philosophy with, art needs a non-art. But the witness is also a non-witness. The impersonal is where we find our persons, but not our personhood. Where personal attention is a means to another state of attention in which I may be demarcated, recognised and recognised, impersonal or a-human attention is that which I become and which becomes in me and everything present, but none having their own presence. Impersonal attention has no attendant nor attended, just guardians who must be worthy of it. It is a circle of ethical seduction. Relinquishing the powers of knowledge for the potentialities of thought interiorises the outside, while the outside interiorises the self. Inner and outer inflect and are neither observable nor divisible. The risky project which relinquishes the subject emphasises that pain of such forsaking of self, the ecstatic delight and the terror of inner experience is something which minoritarians have always had to negotiate. In the shift from perception as signification to the art event as ecstasy is found a jubilant communion of collapse and re-emergence of the organic and the inorganic, the atemporal and the non-oriented spatial without the capacity for anchoring signification, without knowledge, without reflection or structuration, but nonetheless materially expressive affectivity, lived experience and liberated a-humanity. Thank you.